PK52, the Saturday morning meeting, as we promised last week, it's time for like Mr. Professor, Bill Nye the Science Guy, whatever you call it, Pathways of Power. Uh, we want to go old school. This is history. Rear wheel, rear wheel drive. All right, there's a lot of people that have driven either a, man, it's, it's hard to say anymore, but it's a, a vintage car. You see them on TV, you know, uh, the old school 60s and 70s cars that, that uh, now you have to buy, you have to restore. Well, I kind of grew up with those. And what would happen with these cars is the power came from the rear two wheels. So when you would accelerate, and you know, you, you want to smoke the tires every once in a while. If you had a big block V8 in there, you wanted to make sure people knew that you had paid all the money for the ability to burn some rubber. And so what that would cause is that would cause this rear tire to smoke. So what would happen is this tire right here would start to slip and all the power from this differential right here would go to that tire right there. And what we called that was, and I'll write this down for you, we call this a one tire fire. I had a bunch of people that I grew up with that couldn't afford a V8 so they had a six cylinder so if you turn the car to the right enough then what would happen is 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 if you turned it like this and then and then whipped it back that way you could lift these tires off the ground and even get your six cylinder spinning a little bit the little bitty skinny tires well this wasn't very good traction and so people said we got all this horsepower but we have no ability to be able to go so what they did was they allowed this differential back here in the back as, as this tire started spinning at a certain speed, the differential would actually physically lock up and immediately distribute the power to both wheels, and then you would have the two-tire fire. So if you, uh, Brett, help me out. The, uh, the show that, that um, the girl was in the courtroom, my cousin Vinny. Vinny. <laughs> yeah, my cousin Vinny. So the kids were exonerated in the movie My Cousin Vinny because she knew about the locking up rear differential or posi track. So that's how it happened. Here's the big problem though. As gas prices got higher and car companies tried to build smaller and smaller cars, then we had to move all the power to a setup of a front differential and I'm going to show you this and then we'll change the page if I lock a front differential up if I take that differential and lock it up and put even power to both wheels it doesn't give the wheels the ability to turn at different speeds so the biggest problem is you can't turn the vehicle so we had to make sure that we had an open differential that could move power from side to side or we never would have built a vehicle that would work. Some of the original vehicles like the Mustang II and different things like that, the biggest problem they had was, as you hear one of them going by right now, one of the biggest problems they have was is the inside tire wear was immense. So you go through a set of tires, you know, in about 7,000 miles. So Toyota comes out. And we, we start developing the first rear uh, front wheel drive, the real front wheel drive. And so we'll just write front wheel drive right here. They mounted the engine transverse, transversely. All that means instead of the engine running long with a long drive shaft, they turn the engine sideways. So now the power came out of the, the differential and it could go to either wheel. So let's, let's talk about this a second. As I turn this direction, this wheel has to go slower than this wheel because this wheel has a greater arc. So we had all kinds of clutching devices back in the day that would allow that to happen so that this wheel could actually speed up and this wheel could slow down or vice versa. And then what happened in the cars that we initially had in the front wheel drive versions, we didn't have that tire wear we had in the past. But the same thing happens now. Let's go ahead and create this. So we have the same situation that can happen. If I'm on snow and ice, and I start to spin this wheel right here, then the power has to go to this wheel. So I've created the same paradigm. I'm going to spin this one tire, and I'm not going to get any traction. The number one reason that the tire is spinning too fast is, is too much throttle. 
So I guess I'm going to put a lot of this on driver's error. If the road is slick and you over accelerate, you're going to create tire spin. If the road is so slick that you can't get any traction at all, you probably shouldn't be driving on the road. But the first thing that our systems will do in a front wheel drive, we're going to man these systems with a device called traction control or we call it track. So I'm going to put track up here and I'm going to circle it and we're going to watch the pathway of track right now. As this wheel starts to spin and power goes here, the first thing that's going to happen is the engine, the airflow and the fuel are going to be reduced. So the engine, even though you're still in the accelerator and you're trying to go faster, the engine is going to have a whoa, whoa it's going to slow down. Air, air is going to be starved. Fuel is going to be starved and the engine is going to slow down. So now maybe the engine's going slow enough because it's trying to match the RPMs of the engine to the ability of the road. If necessary, and we've talked about this a bunch of times, then what can happen is, is the system can come over here and start applying the brakes to this spinning wheel. Now it doesn't stop the wheel completely, it starts to slow the wheel down. And I'm gonna, hopefully this will be very easy because I want to make sure that any customer that doesn't have any idea how this traction device works can understand this. Let's start out and say that on a good road, 10 would be absolutely perfect sticky asphalt like in the middle of the summer uh, in, in a street corner. And I'd go all the way down to zero, which would be there's no way for the tire to get any traction at all. That would be mirrored ice. Today, as we start to spin, Let's say the road surface has got a little bit of rain on there and the road surface is about a 7. Well, the throttle is going to try to reduce the power to meet that 7 and then the brakes, when they're added, are also going to reduce the wheel spin to this 7. So by holding this wheel down, it's going to make the power start to go to this wheel over here. So now I've transferred the power over here because this wheel didn't have any bite. If this wheel starts to spin, then the brakes can be applied right here, throttle reduction again, and the power can come back over to this wheel. And so watch this, from this wheel to this wheel, this wheel to this wheel, so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So what it does to the car is, if it's really slick outside, it kind of rocks the car until you get going. So I want to tell you a little bit of history of our traction control. The best traction control device we ever put on a car was when the Avalon first came out. When we first put traction control on the Avalon, it was so good that you'd be turning a corner and you would start to slip a wheel and the brakes would work so well that you were no longer turning the corner, which was really bad because you were in the middle of the intersection and the car wouldn't go. So now on our traction device, as you demo the cars for the customer, you can get a little wheel spin here and then you'll feel it shudder. You can physically hear this system kick in and it's trying to kick it back and forth. Everybody that's ever had a vehicle stuck that had to rock a vehicle side to side, rock a vehicle to get that vehicle out, that's the way you do it. You've got to make sure that it gets some bind. By moving the power here, you're tilting the vehicle to this side, you're pitching the weight back to this side, and you move the vehicle like this until it gets going. This device is so super cool that it is from initial start zero miles per hour to unlimited. So if you were going... 25 miles an hour and you're driving into an ice storm and you turn a corner and you start to accelerate to pass somebody and that wheel while you were going 25 miles an hour started to spin the traction control device would slow that spin down based upon the road condition so when you're talking to your customer about traction control understand that this is very very important because the the better this traction control is the better our active traction control can be. We call that active track. The better our automatic limited slip differential can be, the better our vehicle stability control, and I call that enhanced, so the E version of VSC. So active track control, ALSD, vehicle stability control. So over the next couple of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to break these systems down. Remember, we're using throttle and brake to be able to gain power. After this, how does crawl mode work? And how would hill assist work? 
and how will downhill assist work? You see my mission here. So this is traction control. Remember, the customer doesn't have to do anything but drive the car. Even an ex inexperienced driver on a bad road surface, the technology in this car is going to create the paradigm so they're going to get the maximum traction available based upon the technology. I tell customers all the time, when technology becomes big, the bigger you make it, the better it works. This has been PK52 on Toyota's Traction Control. We'll see you next week.